Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are glorious. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you, Father, uh, created all things and uh, by your will and power. We thank you, Father, for this creation that points to uh, you and your glory. We thank you for the glory of your Son. And we will one day see that glory, Father, as your Son returns to the earth to establish his kingdom. We pray, Father, that we might honor and glorify God in our body and spirit, which are God's. And uh, we may give you the praise for who you are and what you have done. And Father, open our eyes uh, so that we might have a better understanding of your word this morning. We pray that you might continue to sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in our first hour, we dealt with the glory of God in Psalm chapter 19. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, we see in creation the, the details of the divine designer. And we're going to continue with some of those details of God's handiwork. Uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. This is a significant verse in relationship of man the creation to God, the creator. For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, who is God who formed the earth and made it, who has established it. Notice, who did not create it in vain. He did not create it without purpose. Who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. God created the earth with a purpose in mind for the habitation of man. Think about this. Uh, the crowning creation of God, created work of God, was the making of man on the sixth day. So we go from day one when God created light to the crowning of creation uh, in day six when God created man in his image. And so the earth was prepared in advance for the habitation of man. Think about that. He did not create it to no purpose. This is not simply an accident, the creation of the earth. We just happen to be here in the right place, in the right location, at the right distance, and all those other things. And it didn't happen by mere coincidence or chance. It was by purpose. And so God did not create the planet and the sun, moon, and stars for no purpose. He did not create it in vain. The idea of emptiness, Song, Song of Solomon, we hear the term vanity of vanity, all is vanity with life under the sun. <laughs> uh, but there is purpose in creation. There is an order that should point to the design, divine designer. He formed this earth to be inhabited. And therefore, this points to the uniqueness of God. Notice that last phrase of Isaiah 45, 18. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There's no other competitors to that divine creator. And there is only one God. We see that, we hear that in the Shema. Is that what Deuteronomy, uh, I think it's 6 4. Hear, o Israel, the Lord our God is what? One. One God, one creator God who formed man and the earth. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, we see that form uh, in the idea of God started to form the earth and shape it and the first three days of creation, then he filled it in the last three days of creation. Uh, so in the beginning, in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We have the introduction, first introduction to God as creator, and also we have the introduction of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So we have the hint of the Trinity right at the beginning of the Word of God. Um, and this earth was created without form. And the idea was it was yet to be formed in the six days of creation. Now keep in mind, Genesis 1.1 is a summary verse. He's summarizing God's creative work. And therefore, 
initially the earth was without shape and God started to form it. God created light in day one in Genesis 1, 3 through 5. And he did so with the spoken word of God. Let there be light. The spoken word of God created light. And so, by the way, we have a light source before the luminaries. Think about that. There was a light source before the creation of the greater light and the lesser light. So we had a light source uh, at the beginning. And then God created in day two the water in the sky. In verses six through eight, we have the water vapor canopy above the earth. And this is where we get the flood, part of the Results of a universe, part of the reason for a universal flood is the water vapor canopy that, that uh, caused the longevity of life on the earth before the flood, that uh, collapsed during the flood and then under the fountains of the earth broke up underneath. So we had all this water from underneath and from above. There's a water vapor canopy above the earth and God created that water vapor canopy. He created the water in the sky in day two, and then he created land and vegetation in day three. Notice in the first three days, we have yet uh, a feeling of God's created order. So if the earth was without form and void, and the idea of the void means it was unfilled at that point, but God would fill his creation from day one through three with creatures and God would create luminaries in the sky. And so day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. Luminaries, a greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Day five, he created fishes and birds. Notice that corresponds to day two. He created water and sky. And so who would inhabit the sky? Birds. Who would inhabit the water? Fish. And uh, therefore, in day three, he created land and vegetation and who would inhabit that? Beast, and then finally man. So he created it to be inhabited, as in Isaiah chapter 40. So if we summarize the first three, three verses of Genesis 1, we have without form, unformed, and then unfulfilled, but God formed it, and then he filled it. So there's order, there's a symmetry to creation. <clears throat> Let's talk about the solar eclipse. <laughs> it's all on our minds. And solar eclipses in general. So we have some scientific facts about the solar eclipse we want to look at this morning. Eclipses show the glory of God and his amazing designs. One of the various things that show God's glory. I think it's one of the greatest displays of God's glory when we look at, uh, at the eclipse. It's amazing to see the sun corona as the moon eclipses uh, the, uh, the sun. And think about all the things that have to come together for an eclipse. To observe an eclipse, you have many factors that have to be just right. Just right. And so, thought about some of the factors that goes into seeing the sun's corona and experiencing an eclipse. Number one, the speed of the moon. Think about that. The speed of the moon has to be just right. We have the size of the moon how large it is in relationship to the earth. So we have, has to be at the right size. And if that moon was larger, you would not see the corona. Think about it, if it was that larger, during an eclipse, it would block out that corona. If it was smaller, you wouldn't see it either. So the size of the moon has to be just right to see that corona. And that's not by accident. We have the shape of the moon. What if the moon was like Mr. Potato Head? <laughs> and there are some moons that are shaped. We'll look at one here in a minute. They're shaped like a potato. And therefore, it's not. there are some moons that are not round. So you have to have a round sphere in order for it to block out the corona. Once again, the shape of the moon has to be right. And not all moons are round. <laughs> Realize that in our solar system. What about the distance of the moon in relationship to the planet? That has to be right. And that's why we had an annual uh, eclipse here in Texas a little while back. And you had the moon that in the relationship of the sun and moon as uh, not being exactly large enough, the moon wasn't quite large enough 
to block out the corona. So you had this ring of fire, you know, apparently around the moon. You had that, that in your eclipse. But a solar eclipse, you had to have just the right distance. And keep in mind that the moon goes around the Earth not in a complete circular orbit. Otherwise, you would have eclipses every single lunar cycle. So God created the, rotate, the uh, path of the moon in an ellipse so that it would not occur every single time. We would kind of get, oh, yeah, there it is, another eclipse, you know. <laughs> Big deal, right, you know? We would get, it would be commonplace, but God created in such a way that these things would be unique, and that's why you have millions of people traveling to Texas to see this thing, because it doesn't occur that often. Now, around the world it does, but in one particular location, I've heard at least 400 years in that same location, you have uh, the, the lunar eclipses. They're spaced out and only, only occur within a certain path even then in the United States. So uh, the distance of the moon in relation to the planet has to be just right to observe an eclipse. Another factor is the distance of the planet from the sun. That would affect the viewing of an eclipse as well. Uh, the nature of the orbit, as we described, not a circle, but an ellipse. So they occur uh, not every single cycle, lunar cycle, but they occur infrequently. And then finally, the atmosphere. <laughs> the atmosphere. If you were on, if you were able to stand on Jupiter, <laughs> I doubt if you would see an eclipse. <laughs> so the atmosphere has to be just right so that we can observe the eclipse, and that has to line up. So all these things have to be just right, just right to see uh, a solar eclipse. Now, here's one of those potato heads. I call Mr. Potato Head. We have this potato-shaped moon of Saturn. Notice the shape here. Uh, of the 64 moons, and now this particular author plotted all the various moons, the main ones at least, in the solar system. There are a lot of smaller moons, but... He plotted 64 moons in the solar system. And he says only a two appear the same size on average as a sun from their host planet. So the idea is if you were able to stand on that planet and observe the, um, the, the sun, the, 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 uh, the idea of seeing an eclipse uh, is unique in reference to our point. Uh, so we have here only two appear the same size on average as the sun from their host planet, our moon and this moon around Saturn. This moon is a small potato-shaped moon, but it produces eclipses lasting less than one second. Another, another factor to speed as it whips around Saturn. So you say, okay, you got your time. There it is, gone. <laughs> now you have kind of a similar effect. I was talking to my friend who lives in, pastor friend who lives in Rome, New York. And I said, Rome, New York is right on the edge of the eclipse. I said, you need to go north if you're going to observe the eclipse. And uh, you might see it briefly for a second or two if you're right on the edge line. Uh, but uh, generally speaking though, eclipses last, can last much longer. So here though, it, it, the, uh, it only lasts one second. So you don't see it. Uh, won't be able to see the full effect, but being a Mr. Potato Head, you can't see it, can't see, see the corona. More of its highly elongated shape compromises the view of the chromosphere, the chromosphere. Now, I don't know if you can see the detail. I know there's all these little dots here. Um, but here, uh, this particular author, he wrote The Privileged Planet, uh, this book describing the use of God's creation. Now, I don't know whether this guy is a believer or not, so I can't recommend everything in this book, but he does have some unique facts uh, concerning the creation or concerning the uh, solar eclipses. He plotted out the various moons uh, in our solar system and from a chart being some moons that are too small to see a solar eclipse, or at least the corona, uh, and those moons that are too large on the right side of the graph and where our moon is, and it's interesting, only one other moon, as far as even the size, lines up to our moon. That one moon of Saturn. So you have the center line here that's just the right distance to see the eclipse. But the problem is with this moon of Saturn, it's Mr. Potato Head. It's a potato shaped, and therefore it's not circular. 
So, for instance, uh, the moons around Jupiter, which most of us are familiar with, they have some of the main moons, Europa and, and Ganymede and uh, Io, Callisto, we have those four moons. We can see the shadow of an eclipse on the planet Jupiter. So we can observe the shadow uh, on other planets. But if you were standing, you were able to, first of all, you're not able to stand on the surface of Jupiter, number one. And number two, if you were able to stand on the surface, these moons would be in relationship to the sun too large. The further back you go in the solar system, the sun becomes what? Smaller. Think about this. So the size of the sun is another factor. So you go back further in the solar system, the size of the sun shrinks. Um, so those moons, from reference to the planet, are too large. Too large. Uh, we have certain moons around Saturn. Other, the other moons around Saturn, uh, those are too large. And then most of Uranus's moons, I think there's only two in the other category, they're too large or the, these two are too small. And uh, Pluto has one that's way too, uh, off this chart, too large from perspective of the planet. And it's way out, so the sun is even smaller, and you don't have the same effect as we have here on Earth. So some, from the perspective of, you know, Saturn, there are some moons that are too small. So if you have a too small of a moon, you don't see the corona. Others are too large. Too large of a moon, you don't see the corona. And then the shape of the moon has to be circular. So all these factors have to come into play. We are unique. Understand that. If we're able to observe that solar eclipse tomorrow, just think about this. This is a unique observance in our solar system. We are, we, we are unique. Out of all these main 64 moons uh, and others, we could add two that's smaller in our solar system, we're the only one in a unique position to be able to see what we see. And to me, that's not by accident. That's not by accident. So of the 64 moons, only two appear the same size on average as the sun from their host planets, our moon and this moon uh, around Saturn, a small potato-shaped moon. So we are unique in that sense. Now, here are the two moons of Mars. And notice the two moons of Mars are not large enough to cover the disk of the sun, number one. Number two, uh, Phobos and, and I think it's pronounced Deimos, but those two moons are not round either. So they're not large enough to cover the disk of the sun so that you can see the corona, and they are not round either. So you're not going to see on Mars what we see here on the Earth as regard, in regard to the eclipse. Now, talking about the four moons of Jupiter, which you can easily observe, I saw that just, I think it was the night before last or last night, the night before last, looking at the moons of Jupiter, saw four, four of them lined up. Uh, those moons are too large to see the corona if you were able to stand on Jupiter. Number two, they also move too fast, whew, whipping around the planet. Uh, so that the eclipse will last about one second. Boop, that's it. Uh, and then you can't stand on the surface of Jupiter. And that's another big problem, right? <laughs> it's a gaseous planet. And then, here's another factor you don't normally think about. The average temperature on Jupiter is minus 166 degrees. Now, I know Duluth, Minnesota is cold. <laughs> but uh, it would seem warm <laughs> if you were on Jupiter. <laughs> 166 degrees below zero. You wouldn't want to be on Jupiter to see any eclipse. I don't think you would have any travelers <laughs> traveling and stepping outside to see that. So think about all those factors, and it's only just this, the our view is just right. Now, what makes this happen is the is this: the sun's diameter is 400 times larger than the moon's diameter, but the sun is 400 uh, 400 times further away from the moon. So think about how that has to come together. Uh, so the sun is much larger, but it, since it's 400 times further. You have the apparent size of the moon with the sun as equal. Consequently, the sun and moon appear the same size in the sky, about a half a degree. Therefore, when the moon covers the sun, it just barely does so. If the moon were a little smaller or further away, 
there will be no total solar eclipses. This is by a book, Danny Faulkner, The Heavens, A Different View. And we have uh, Jim Bonzer has some photographs in that book. Uh, several of his, him and, him and his wife have several photographs in that book. But uh, think about that. If the moon were a little smaller further away, there would be no total solar eclipses. But if the moon were larger or closer, solar eclipses would be grossly over total. That is, the beautiful prominences in corona would not be visible. So total solar eclipses would not be nearly as spectacular. And total solar eclipses would be visible over much larger portions of the Earth, making them more common. While a total solar eclipse occurs on average about every year and a half somewhere on the Earth, the path of totality of the, uh, each eclipse is very narrow. So very little of the Earth may experience any given eclipse. For any location on Earth, a total solar eclipse is seen about once in four centuries on average. Many of the other planets have natural satellites or moons. There are about 200 known. But only on the Earth are the conditions of rarity and extreme beauty combined. Think about that. Rarity and beauty combined. And only on the Earth does it matter. Because only on Earth are there creatures to appreciate them. I don't know if any Martians out there observe <laughs> eclipses on Mars. Um, we're the only creation that's designed to appreciate the creator. Think about that. Um, only on Earth does it matter because only on Earth are there creatures to appreciate them. One can believe this merely is coincidence. Eh, it just happened to happen. You know, it's happen chance. However, I think total solar eclipses are a precious gift of God that can lead us to understand that the heavens do declare God's glory. So one of the means of declaring the glory of God. And I can tell you from the Nebraska eclipse, it's an awesome when it goes into totality just to see that corona just glowing like fire. It's an awesome experience reminding us of a divine designer. Already, depending where the moon is in its orbit at the time of the eclipse, it can be just a little too far away to completely cover the sun, which is what we had uh, down in San Antonio, I think, the annular eclipse. As the outer edge of the sun remains visible, there isn't quite the same darkness, making it much difficult to see the sun's upper, much more difficult to view the sun's upper atmosphere. Now, a couple features, just wanted to mention. Uh, there, we could go into several features that uh, if the sky is clear, you could see. Bailey's beads, by the way, is one of those features. As soon as it goes into totality for a brief period of time, there's these little well, points of light that are kind of separated like beads. Uh, and notice here, uh, for a fraction of a second at the beginning and end of totality, Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect are visible. Both are caused by a tiny bit of photosphere peeking through irregularities such as craters on the moon's limb. Bailey's beads appear as a string of pearls along a small arc of the lunar limb. So another picture of beauty, of beauty uh, when, the, when you go the moment of totality. And now we have also the diamond ring effect, and this is more observable as far as, and I want to caution you, you don't want to look at the sun <laughs> without your solar glasses, okay? We got t tons of them back there. We got piles of, we got a bushel back at, a basket full of solar glass. So take one, take several. Um, but at the time of, to right at the time of totality, uh, you have this diamond ring effect. All of a sudden you have this bright diamond ring and then whoosh, it goes into totality is a beautiful effect and it looks like a di sparkling diamond ring and so the diamond ring is a burst of light that looks like a diamond while the ring consists of the innermost part of the corona completely around the sun so it looks like a diamond ring and so there's beautiful bright light and then you have that at the beginning of the eclipse and at the end you have the reverse effect the diamond ring so that's something to see right at the moment it just gets bright and then all of a sudden poof, you're in totality by the way, once the moon is covering the sun in totality, you could take off your glasses and view and take pictures. So I'll tell you, you want to keep 
your glasses on during totality, you can take it as safe to view. The, uh, this eclipse is safe to view once it goes into totality. Um, now, another thing, I just thought I'd throw this in. Another, uh, I was discussing this with Jim, um, and uh, we were talking about uh, another really weird effect, uh, and that's called, um, what are those shadows, Jim? What are they called? Shadow bands, that's right, shadow bands. We were talking about shadow bands. And about, you know, some say two minutes, some say up to 30 seconds before the eclipse. Uh, you have, because of such a narrow band uh, that of light left, you have these mysterious shadows that look like snakes moving up and down on the ground. <laughs> They're like the wavy shadows. And some have stated that might be a phenomena created by shimmering in the upper atmosphere, several way, descriptions, scientific ways to try to describe what these, why we have these mysterious shadows, but they like moving around. And hopefully we'll have a, if, if it's clear enough, we'll have a white sheet. I want to try to record the shadow bands. It's like seeing Sasquatch, if you can record it. <laughs> <laughs> we got a Sasquatch sighting here. It's a, you know, it's just a rare event, a rare thing to see these shadow bands. But you have this weird effect of these shadows and, and this uh, is the reverse. After totality, you have this, you know, 20 second period or 30 where you see if uh, you have a clear white sheet or board, white board, you can see these shadows just kind of mysteriously moving. They're really faint, but uh, you get some weird effects uh, right before and after totality. Now, let's talk about, uh, we, we addressed this the first hour about God creating the... Uh, the sun and moon and stars for signs, signs. Now, you hear a lot of things about, well, this eclipse coming up is a prophecy of return of Christ. So, uh, you know, uh, you hear that there's a, there's a prophetic significance, I'll put it today, to the solar eclipse, and I would say, no, there's not. And there's a reason for that. Now, the reason for that is, you remind, we need to remind ourselves, we live and the dispensation of the grace of God. We're awaiting the return of Christ for the church. Now, the church is a mystery age hidden in the Old Testament. So if you have passages like Joel and Isaiah, how can that refer to the church? Because that's a mystery age. So it's referring to things that will occur after the church. So here's a simple order of events. If, you know, a lot of people are confused about Bible prophecy, but just think about the broad picture of the events. And it's really simple when you when they boil it down. The book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, all these other prophetic events, a lot of details, but when you put it in simplistic form, all those events will fit into a, a definite order. A church age, which is where we, the time period we're living now. The next event on God's calendar is the rapture. And that means Christ can return at any moment. And he returns for the church. We call that the imminent return of the Lord. After the church age, uh, after church age is, is over, all the believers are caught up to be with the Lord or resurrected. We have that seven-year tribulation. And majority of the book of Revelation deals with the seven years, from chapter 4 on to chapter 19. So all those various events, sealed trumpet tr uh, judgments, trumpet judgments, bold judgments, that's that seven-year period. And keep in mind, we will be with the Lord during that period of time. We will stand at the Bema uh, evaluation and the marriage. We'll be married to Christ. But on the earth will be these judgments. And these are judgments that will be signs for Israel. And uh, after that seven-year period, we have the second coming of Christ. Christ is coming to the earth. He's coming to establish his kingdom. And his kingdom, I take it literally, uh, a thousand years, six times used in Revelation 20, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. How long is a thousand years? I don't know. <laughs> it's a thousand years. I'm sorry, I'm a literist. I take it literally. A thousand years. Um, and then we have the kingdom of Christ, which is still future, um, pre-millennial. And then we have the destruction of the heavens and the earth. We address that the first hour. And God will create what? In Revelation 21.1? a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. That's a simple order. So all those confusing events, just place them. A lot of events fall in that tribulation period, that seven-year period of time. So Christ, I, yeah, the animation here, Christ is going to return for the church, he's, and he'll rapture us, and then he's going to come, 
And finally, at his second coming, he's going to come on a white horse and return to the earth. All right. Now, I saw this on the internet. This sign is April 8th, 2024, a sign of the second coming. And the verse, go to verse, which we read the first hour, we'll look at this again Luke 21, 25 through 28. There will be signs in the sun and in the earth and the or moon and the stars on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seeds and waves roaring, men's heart fall, falling them, filling them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Now, first thing, as I mentioned last hour, uh, that prior verse addresses Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles, and now I think he's addressing Israel here. And individuals will see these signs of the second coming of Christ. Now, if we go back to our prophecy chart, what coming is that? Uh, we're not talking about the coming of Christ for the church. We're talking about people who will remain on earth after the rapture that will be awaiting Christ's return to the earth in his kingdom. That is called the second coming of Christ. Those signs are for that generation. So there are no signs preceding the return of Christ for the church. Otherwise, it would not be imminent. We have the imminent return of Christ is a signless event. So no lunar eclipse, no series of lunar eclipses, no solar eclipses, no earthquake, no nothing like that is a sign of the return of Christ for the church. Understand that. That is the next event, literally. Now, other things may happen prophetically, but they don't have to happen. The, only, the return of Christ is imminent. We see some stage setting, that, which I would call it, in the background, nations aligning and all that, but... Really, no major prophecy is fulfilled before the return of Christ, and that's the literally the next event. So <clears throat> this period of tribulation will include some signs that deal with the sun, some signs of darkening, some signs that will deal with the sky and the stars. Uh, and so some of those judgments deal with the, that phenomenon. And therefore, there'll be indicators of God's judgment and indicators of Christ's second coming. And therefore, there'll be for individuals living on the earth during that period of time. So after the rapture of the church, we have a series of seven judgments, seals, trumpet, and, and bold judgments. And there's another series called thunder judgments, but the Bible doesn't indicate what those are, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, but we do have these series of judgments that will occur that will be signs of the return of Christ in his second coming, picturing judgment upon the earth. So that, that would be right before the second coming of Christ. Uh, second passage that is, uh, I think, misinterpreted in Acts 2, 19-21, I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And again, this is a quoting of the book of Joel. Uh, if you read the context of Joel, he's talking about the nation of Israel in reference to the coming of Christ. Uh, we have the campaign of Armageddon later on in that. Joel chapter 3 and uh, Christ's millennial reign. So it's during that time frame that these signs will occur. And I think they could include those sealed trumpet and bold judgments uh, that will be signs of the return of Christ and his second coming. Now you hear this idea of blood moon, tetrad, there are four blood moons, and then, you know, here's another. So we had the Passover, and there's a popular preacher <laughs> who wrote a book about these blood moons. And so you had Passover occurring on the significant Jewish festivals, 4, 15, 14, and then we, we have these four Jewish feasts that occurred in succession. So you have these tetrads of blood moons, and that's a fulfillment of Acts chapter 2. It means that Christ could return at any time. Well, uh, Christ could return at any time because he said so, not because of four <laughs> blood moons. <laughs> okay? I'm not looking for the blood moons before the return of Christ. But there will be significant signs in the sun, moon, and stars 
after the church is gone. And I understand that. So you get this idea. Don't get on the blood moon train. <laughs> Another one. Three Purim eclipses in a row. Isn't that significant that we have on the day of Purim or close to the time of Purim we have the eclipse? And this is how they try to tie in the various eclipses to the return of Christ. This three in a row. Isn't that significant? This right on the same festival feast. And this one guy I was listening to, he's trying to tie it into the book of Esther and kind of like, okay, is that prophetic? <laughs> Was that a prophetic book? It's not Daniel. And, and, you know, there might be some typology of Haman, the Antichrist. Yeah, I can get that. But, you know, trying to create a, a, a prophetic chart out of the book of Esther, really tying into these blood moons. And God's like, Whoa. you know, I was like, don't waste your time on this stuff. I have to know this stuff because, you know, I have to warn you. But, you know, uh, <laughs> This is an indicator of God's judgment on America because we got these three pyramid eclipses in a row on these dates and all that nonsense. And, you know, no, no. These things declare God's beauty, God's, God's design, as they do consistently throughout history. But there's no prophetic significance. Some even say, well, these two pass, they, they create a, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet that, that declares God's judgment, you know, and... <laughs> They cross over, and you can look at them sideways and say, oh, yeah, there's that Hebrew letter, which means judgment, and da-da-da-da. I was like, let me pound my head on the table. <laughs> Don't go for that nonsense. Don't go for it. You say, oh, it seems, oh, this is, oh. But realize what the Bible reveals clearly. And uh, we need to realize uh, the, those things and not get caught up in this type of stuff. So um, we have verse 29, Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now, clearly phenomena in the sky uh, mentioned here, uh, but in reference to what? The time frame, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay? Uh, we go back to... The time period of tribulation, that would be right before the second coming, or right near the end of the tribulation, right? We're not in the tribulation. We believe in the pre-trib rapture. Christ is coming for the church first. So Matthew 24, 29 does not apply to us. It will apply to individuals in that time frame of the tribulation period before the second coming of Christ. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, these phenomena will occur, and therefore that will be filled in the, that period of time. Now, this is tied in, I think, in the same period in Joel. Uh, so if we look over in the book of Joel, if you have your Bibles, let's turn over to the book of Joel. Um, in Joel chapter 2, verse 30, 32, this is quoted by uh, Peter in Acts 2. And let's continue reading to the end of the chapter. Context, Old Testament context. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, and some will be turned into darkness, the moon and the blood, before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. And I think this is the last part of the tribulation period, by the way, an intensified phase called the great and awesome day of the Lord. The whole seven years is the day of the Lord, but this is an intensified period near the end called the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I think Israel will turn to their Messiah at the end. And notice, in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. Remember what Jesus said, when you see all these signs looked up for your what? Jews, your redemption draws near. Tied it in to that passage. Okay? So, significant in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. And the Lord has said, among whom the remnant, whom the Lord calls. Zechariah 12, 14 describes God delivering those Jews who are attacked in Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation period. When the nations surround Jerusalem, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will return and rescue those Jews. He will deliver those Jews. So that's a significant event referred to, not some event in the church age in that context. 
Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. Joel 3, 14 through 16. Multitude, multitude in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will roar from Zion. Jerusalem, literal return of Christ to the earth. He will establish his king and kingship in Jerusalem. Utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people. Who's his people? Read the next line. The strength of the children of Israel. That's the context, his people. He'll rescue the Jews and they'll turn to their Messiah in faith. They will look on him whom they have pierced. And we have the salvation of Israel at that time. So once again, this is not before the rapture of the church. This is future. Um, Reynolds Shires put a little chart together of various cosmic disturbances in those series of sealed trump and bull judgments. The sixth seal judgment we have, various disturbances. Men will go to the caves and hide, hide from the Lord for his wrath has come. Uh, we have the seventh, fourth trumpet judgment. There will be cosmic disturbances. The fifth trumpet judgment. And then finally, the sixth bowl, and then the Joel 3 described in Matthew 24. So there'll be various blackouts of the sky, various disturbances among the sun, moon, and stars. There'll be indicators of God's judgment and also return of Christ for the church. But again, that's after the rapture of the church. We will be in heaven. If you're a believer, you'll be in heaven during that time. And so those are some of the events that are in reference to those judgments. Now, Showers asked this question. Uh, why will God cause the dark cosmic disturbances of the sun, moon, and stars in conjunction with his day of the Lord judgments? What's the reason for that? And I think this is a great answer. God caused the sun, moon, and stars to darken at the same time he began to pour out his wrath on the people of Israel as an indication that they were being judged because they worshiped celestial bodies instead of him. And so men will be worshiping the creation rather than the creator during the tribulation. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm in charge of the creation. Just like in Exodus, by the way. Now, if we look at this next chart, I think I have, well, a couple points. The church age is a mystery. This is, by the way, this is something that you hear a lot of prophecy teachers, even some sound prophecy teachers. This point is left out by a lot of them. The church age is a mystery not foreseen in the Old Testament. Ephesians 3, 1 through 10. So the Old Testament prophets did not foresee the church age. It's a mystery. Therefore, the consummation of the church age is also a mystery. Paul says, you know, also 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Unforeseen in the Old Testament. The rapture is not in the Old Testament. I think the first mention of rapture in the Bible is John 14. It's not even in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the first mention of the rapture is in John 14, the night before Jesus' crucifixion. The rapture of the church is an imminent event, meaning no other events has to occur before the return of Christ for the church. Otherwise, you destroy imminency. Here's a perspective, Clarence Larkin, how the prophets in the Old Testament... They saw the first coming of Christ, you know, Christ dying on the cross, Isaiah 53, a Messiah, coming Messiah who would be born in Bethlehem. We think of Micah 5, 2, first advent. We have the second coming of Christ, the rise of the Antichrist. God's now dealing with Israel before the second coming. We have the return of Christ to the earth, his future kingdom. They saw that. What they didn't see is where we are today. We're in that valley. We're in this, mist, this valley of the church. It was hidden from their view. Understand that. So we're in that period of time, hidden from view. And therefore, the events that we see, and I don't mean to be repetitious, but this is important. <laughs> the events that we see in these cosmic disturbances will occur after the church is in heaven. Now, the imminent see the rapture. Let's take a look at Philippians 4.5. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. 
the Lord is at hand. Now think about that short, simple phrase, the Lord is at hand. What does that mean? In Paul's lifetime, the Lord could return at any moment. And that's been true. The return of Christ, you say, well, return of Christ is soon. I prefer the word imminent than soon. Soon means it could happen within a short period of time. Now, it may be soon, but it's always imminent. It's impending, overhanging. When we speak of return of Christ, we need to use the word imminent. The imminent return of Christ for the church is at hand. James 5 uses the language, a judge is standing at the door. And we have that perfect tense in the Greek, meaning that he stood at the door when James wrote that letter, and he continues to stand at the door. It's imminent. He's ready. At God's timing, Christ will come for the church. Could happen at any time. Could happen today. Before the solar eclipse. How about that? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> we'll just go by the sun, past the sun, moon, and stars, into the very presence of Christ. That would be a more glorious thing to see the Lord return, wouldn't it? Much more glorious than the eclipse. Now, <clears throat> we're out of time. <laughs> but I want to wrap this up. Think about various signs in the past that God used. And we had time to look at the Egyptian plagues that will mirror some of these judgments in the future. Uh, those are literal judgments, by the way, in Egypt, indicating the literal nature of those future judgments. We had literal darkness in Egypt. See, a little darkness and truth. This is why I believe those judgments are literal, because of the parallel between those judgments and Egypt, the, some of the bold judgments. Uh, so those are some of the things that will occur after the church is gone. And we can describe imminency as something impending, overhanging, about to occur at any moment. Um, and therefore, uh, Jesus Christ's return could occur at any time. We'll skip over that. We know that the rapture and the second coming are not the same event. Uh, the rapture is just number four I want to point out. The rapture is signless. Signless. But after the rapture, there will be signs, Matthew 24, 3, that will indicate the second coming, return of Christ to the earth. So those are two separate events. Contrast between the rapture and the second coming. Um, more contrast comes in the air, he comes to the earth, comes, claims his bride, he comes with his bride. There you go, Nate and Katie. <laughs> I want to end up, though, with this question. It, you know, it's important, it's great that if you believe God is your creator, that's great. But you know what? We need to believe in special revelation about the gospel. Uh, the gospel is good news. Uh, the question to ask for you if you should die today, would you be 100% certain that you would wake up in heaven? Think about that question. Very important question you need to ask. The Bible indicates we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. Sin is a barrier between you and God. And therefore, we're separated from a holy God because we're sinful. That includes all of us. That's why God sent Jesus. Jesus Christ died in our place. He took our punishment that we deserved. Christ died for our sins. He died as our substitute, according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Your good works is not, are not enough. You can try to be good enough to go to heaven, but the Bible says we're not saved by good works. Not a works as any man should boast. Attending church is good. After you're born again, being baptized, feeding the poor, those are good things, but those things will not earn you heaven. The Bible says you're saved by grace, which means undeserved favor. Ephesians 2, 8, you've been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? A gift. A gift is something that someone else paid for that we freely receive. That's what salvation is. It's a free gift by God's grace. We need to place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that is by simple faith. There's no other condition required on our part but faith. One condition, faith. Believe. Will you receive God's gift of eternal life by simply placing your faith in Jesus? What are you trusting in Jesus for? Everlasting life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Eternal life begins when? Not when you die, the moment you believe. It's given to you the moment you believe. Eternal life. 
And so I'm not looking to go to heaven because I'm good, but because Christ took the punishment for me, rose from the dead, and he gives me eternal life as a free gift by God's grace. And by the way, we're secure in Christ when we believe. You can never lose your salvation. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. And the Bible says, these things I've written that you might believe in the name of the Son of God that you might, what, know you have eternal life? I don't have to be unsure. I can know because of Jesus. If it was based on my performance, I would never know for sure because I could fail next week. If it's based on what Jesus did, then hey, it's a gift. It's based on what he did, then I can be sure. So assurance comes by believing the right gospel, not the wrong gospel. So God is offering eternal life, and hopefully you are ready for that by having placed your faith in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the fact that you are the divine creator, and you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for sinful man. We thank you for that free gift of everlasting life by faith in your son. And Father, help us to stand firm in your truth and worship you and give you the praise that you rightfully deserve. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um,